opportunity to convey my sincere tabrikat and mubarakis on the viladat of the fourth imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salatu wassalam. When it comes to the life of any masoom, specifically when it comes to the life of an imam, it becomes important that specifically when it comes to the munasibat of the viladat, then it becomes important that while we look at the fadail of a ma'asum, it also becomes very important for us that in addition to the fadail and the merits and the virtues of a ma'asum, it is extremely important for us to understand the sacrifices made by that ma'asum as a result of which this religion of the Ahlul Bayt comes to us on a silver platter. And you can rest assured that this religion of the Ahlul Bayt, this madhhab e haqqa that has come to us, it has not come without sacrifices and huge persecutions of the ma'asum. And in order to understand what a ma'asum has done for the religion of God, as a result of which Allah has given the entire authority of the universe into their hands, one of the best ways to understand is to understand the sharaat and the conditions that exist during the time of the Masum. And specifically when we look at 
life of the fourth Imam. Today is the Biladat of the fourth Imam. It becomes important to understand what this Imam went through and what he did in order to ensure that after the event of Karbala, when after the tenth of Ashura, after the Asr of Ashura, when in a very, very difficult circumstances, the Imamat gets transferred from the third Imam to the fourth Imam. And he is now becoming the Imam of the world, the Imam of the universe. At a time when in front of him he sees his father being killed, and now he's to assume the charge of the Imamat, the official role and the responsibilities that have been placed upon him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does he navigate through all these problems to give us this religion that now we can say will continue up to the day of judgment without any doubt. And in this scenario and in this case, if you look at the life of the fourth Imam, the life of the fourth Imam is very similar to the life when you compare it amongst all the 12 Imams. There's a great similarity and resemblance between the life of the fourth Imam and the life of the seventh Imam, Imam Musa al-Qadim alayhi salatu was salam. When you look at the lives of these two Imams, you would find there's a lot of similarity. A lot of similarity between these two Imams. So for example, this is very superficially because today is not the Shahadat or Muzasibat of the seventh Imam. But when you look at these two Imams, you find that there's a lot of similarity. One, both of these Imams had a long span of Imamat. 37 years for the seventh Imam, 34 odd years for the fourth Imam. A very long span. But more important than that was that each of these two Imams found themselves becoming the Imam after a revolution has taken place. So when it comes to the fourth Imam, there is a revolution by the killing of Hussein in Karbala and immediately after that revolution, an overwhelming event taking place, suddenly he finds the fourth Imam that he is now the Imam. The same thing takes place with the seventh Imam. We will not discuss the seventh Imam. I am just giving you short similarities some other time the details would come. But just as the fourth Imam found himself after a massacre having taken place in Karbala, after a revolution taking place, after an overwhelming change of scenario taking place in terms of a military expedition by Yazid over Hussein ibn Ali and the family of the Holy Prophet, he finds himself to be the Imam. The seventh Imam finds himself after a revolution. Revolution, revolution of knowledge, a ilmi revolution of the sixth Imam. And both the Imams. Now you know what happened during the time of the sixth Imam. A revolution of ilm takes place. A revolution of knowledge takes place. As a result of which now the seventh Imam is finding himself in the throes of a very, very sensitive phase. There the fourth Imam now has to maintain what Hussein did in Karbala. The seventh Imam has to maintain what the sixth Imam did in terms of knowledge. And hence their roles become very difficult. The responsibility becomes very difficult. But right now we are focusing on the fourth Imam. And the fourth Imam when you look at him, it's an ajeeb scenario because now the situation is extremely suffocating. He finds himself into a scenario he finds himself that Hussein has been killed. And try to understand the scenario. Hussein gets killed in Karbala. There's a reverberation echoing right across the Islamic world. Initially, it was the Kharji have been killed. But now as the word keeps going out, they realize it's not a Kharji. It's not somebody who stood up against Yazid for power. The man who has been killed is the grandson of the Holy Prophet. Now suddenly the ripple starts moving around. And one of the most vociferous consequences take place when the delegation from Medina goes to Sham that Hussein has been killed. Yazid is now claiming himself to be the absolute Khalifa of the Muslimin. That group from Medina goes to Sham. When they come back they say we cannot do taqlid. We cannot follow this Khalifa al Muslimin. This man cannot be Khalifa al Muslimin. So the people who are living in Sham ask these individuals who have people living in Medina ask these individuals who had gone to Yazid in Sham and have come back with the reports of Yazid, alaykum salam. I have reports from Yazid. says, we can't consider him to be the Khalifatul Muslimin. Saying, why not? Saying, because this man, Yashribul Khamr, he consumes alcohol. Yalabbil Kilab, he plays with dogs. 
He listens to music. He sees the dancing girls. This man cannot be the Khalifatul Muslimin. And now all of a sudden in the entire Islamic government, there are ripples. There are voices of dissent coming. And always whenever a dictator is faced with voices of dissent, you would always find the first thing that he does is he wants to suppress them. He wants to oppress them. And this is what Khalifatul Muslimin, which was there at that time Yazid begins. Now that entire Bani Umayya are very, very watchful to see what is happening in the entire Islamic setup that is there. Any form of dissent they want to crush. Any form of uprising they want to crush. Anyone daring to speak out against the Khalifa needs to be crushed. And this is where the fourth Imam finds himself. We are not going to discuss the political scenario. That is for some other time. Today we want to explain the certain divine interventions that you can see in the life of the fourth Imam. And in the light of the fourth Imam, because of the fourth Imam, there are certain secrets. There are certain mysteries. There are certain Aqaid of the Shiite faith that we need to clarify which we will do through the life of the fourth Imam. You know that fourth Imam when he comes he's facing individuals of the life of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thakhafiyah. He you're facing the likes of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. If you remember the last lecture that we had when we were talking about the journey from from Medina to Makkah of Hussein ibn Ali we had mentioned one thing that Quran when it talks about that shajara malauna it talks about Marwan and his children. Abdul Malik is the first son of Marwan. This man was regarded to be very pious. He would always be in the mosque till he comes to know that his father Marwan has passed away. Once he comes to know his father Marwan has passed away, Abdul Malik was seated in the mosque. He would be referred to as Hamamatul Masjid. Hamama in Arabic means pigeon. Pigeon kabutar. Masjid ka kabutar kahilata tha. Because always he would be found in the mosque. This time he's reading the Quran in the mosque. Somebody comes and says, Abdul Malik, you've become the Khalifa. He's saying, how so? He's saying, your father has been killed. Your father has passed away. Marwan is no longer there. Now you become the Khalifa. Rewaad say, history say, Quran is in front of him. He's reading the Quran. As soon as he comes to know, Marwan, his father is dead. And he's become the Khalifa. Rewaad say, he pushes the Quran. Push is the Quran and says, now nobody ever dare tell me about taqwa Allah. Anybody talks about the taqwa of God to me now, it is my sword and his neck. I will now rule with the authority as I feel fit. And then the un he unleashes a, a wave of persecution that was to overtake the entire Shiite world. And Imam Sajjawad is not protected and immune from it. But that's a different scenario. I'm trying to tell you, in which surrounding he comes up, in which surrounding Imam finds himself this man now is paying two hoots to the Quran. He is not worried about the taqwa. He is not worried about God. He is only worried about the power that has come to him. Now Imam Sajjad has to make sure that the religion for which Hussein sacrificed his life is now to be navigated through these turbulent waters so that the other Imams can take over. But in order to do this, the start of Sajjad has a very divine intervention. As I said, fourth Imam has a very peculiar characteristic. He's got several Shabahat with several Imams. I just mentioned in the beginning, few Shabahat with respect to the seventh Imam. But when it comes to his Biladat, it's exactly similar to the Biladat of the twelfth Imam. Sheikh Abbas Kumin Muntahal Muntahal Amal narrates an incident as to how Imam Sajjad was born. No, as to how the start of Imam Sajjad takes place. He says this is the time of the second Khalifa. Omar is the Khalifa. Ali is still there. All issues Ali is keeping quiet. Khilafat has been taken away from him. At that point of time, at that point of time, the soldiers of the Muslim army had attacked the Romans, had attacked the Persians. You see, at the time in the Hejaz, Arabian Peninsula, there were three superpowers. One, the Islamic power under the Holy Prophet. The Prophet has passed away. Abu Bakr, Omar consolidating. The second power was the Roman Empire. The third was the Persian Empire. These three empires were the superpowers. Because of some reason, the Muslims were forced to attack the Persians. 
having attacked Persians they took a lot of people as captives one of the individuals who were taken captives was the grandson of the Emperor of Persia by the name of Shahriyar Shahriyar was a very very famous Emperor of Persia his son was Yazdajar Yazdajar's daughter that means Shahriyar's potri ya poti whatever you call it she is captured amongst all the captives that are brought to Medina because the Khalifa of the work at that time Omar was in Medina so this girl is now brought to Medina amazing thing is that when this girl is brought to Medina her face is covered so Omar asked who is this saying this is the granddaughter of Shahriyar and the daughter of Yazdajar the kings of the Roman of the Persian Empire so as he sees this there's a huge tamasha going on because as people come to know somebody from the royal family of the Rome of the Persians and now in Medina the people of Medina gather the ladies of Medina gather oh Shahzadi has come Shahzadi of Fars has come so they come to listen they come to watch her at that point of time Ali comes to know so Ali and Hussein listen to this incident huh? Ali and Hussein narrated also by Sheikh Mufid in his book Kitabul Irchad you can have references over there as they come Ali is there Hassan is there Hussein is there Omar comes Medina is there yes the judge's daughter is there as she is standing she is putting a veil on her face this is not the ravaj of the of the of the Persians to put a veil anyway she is putting a veil Omar comes and asks her now that you have come to you come to me why are you putting a veil I need to see who you are so he moves forward to put the veil of her hair of her face as she says sees Omar's hand coming to lift the veil she speaks out in Farsi because she's from Persia she said something to this effect she says why bar dustin saying woe be upon that hand that wants to uncover the daughter of Shahriyar now she speaks in Farsi Omar doesn't know Farsi he flies into a rage he's saying this lady is abusing me and thus needs to be punished because she's abusing the Khalifa of the Muslimin he is wanting to pass orders so that she could be punished Ali intervenes Ali says Omar you can't do this so Omar says why not so Ali says if you don't understand the language doesn't mean that you take a decision that she is now abusing you so he tells Ali Omar what did she say so Ali is saying no Ali is translating listen to these words because something very important is coming Ali is translating that she said that woe be upon the hands that cast aside the veil upon my face Ali is translating that means Ali born in Medina Ali bred in Makkah and Medina Ali born in Makkah bred in Makkah and Medina means Hijaz means Arabic language means only the Arabic surroundings he is now listening to a lady coming from Fars and translating it for Omar this is where we've got one of the aqaid of the Imam of faith regarding the Imams Imam is supposed to be the most superior person living on the earth at that point of time and if at times we find in our share that when there is a comparison between Hussein and Abbas there's always this thing that Abbas is Shuja was more than that of Hussein don't ever fall into that misconception that Abbas's Shuja'at was more than Hussein Abbas's Shuja'at was given an opportunity to show itself otherwise if you and me were to consider Abbas's Shuja'at more than Hussein you and me would have felt and said eventually that Shuja'at of Abbas more than Hussein that means now Hussein is lacking in Shuja'at to Abbas and an Imam can never be found lacking to an imam to a non-imam understand this very carefully your sajjad is now talking your imam ali is now translating in from farsi into arabic to omar this is another of our aqidah an imam has to be perfect in all sense he needs to know all languages you heard over here born in hijaz bred up in arabic culture is now translating from Ar from farsi into arabic but this is not what is very important all of us know they need to know all the languages but we need to know the extent of the domain of the authority of an Imam who is Imam Barhaq and a divine representative it transgresses all imaginations that you and me can have here you and me are talking about him knowing the language of all the people but I would go 
go further to tell you that this also includes language of the animals. Language of the animals. Listen, Imam Sajjad, I'm coming to it. Ali is just a message to link up Imamat and understand a few things to get them clarified in our mindset so that we don't end up with misconceptions thinking Abbas was more brave than Hussein. If Abbas was more brave than Hussein, then Abbas should have been the Imam. Yar, the knowledge, the knowledge of the languages does not just encompass the humans. It goes beyond the humans to the animals. You want me to tell you? Masjid Kufa, Hussein's father Ali is on the member, giving a khutbah. Narration narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah Jofi. In Islamic fiqh and the Islamic narration, we've got two Jabir ibn Abdullah, very famous personality. We've got so many Jabir ibn Abdullah, but two major personalities. One, Jabir ibn Abdullah Ansari, that same old man who was the first Zayr of Hussein in Arba'in. All of us have heard about it. Who was also told, you will lead such a long life that when you meet my fifth Imam, give him my salam. Jabir ibn Abdullah Ansari. There is another person, but an exactly opposite person. Opposite in what sense? In Fadilat? No. In virtue? No. In Taqwa? No. In age? Yes. The second person we've got is Jabir ibn Abdullah Jofi. Jabir ibn Abdullah Ansari, one of the Sahaba of the Holy Prophet. Jabir ibn Abdullah Jofi, one of the companions of the fifth Imam. Jabir ibn Abdullah Ansari, old man loses his eyesight because of his age. Jabir ibn Abdullah Jofi, 25 year old. But the ma'rifat that this 25 year old had prompted the fifth Imam to reveal the mysteries of the universe to this 25 year old boy. His imagination, his understanding, his ma'rifat of the Imam Imam to such an extent that you look up the hadith of the fifth Imam to Jabir ibn Abdullah Jofi, you will realize it is not ordinary hadith. He's talking about ma'arif that Imam would never speak to other. 25 year old boy, he is narrating this hadith. Ali standing onto the member, he's narrating from him. One of the Ravis, Jabir ibn Abdullah Jofi, says Ali, Masjid Kufa, standing on the member, giving a khutbah. We're talking about language, huh? Don't lose track. As he's giving a khutbah, there is a furor in Masjid Kufa. Why? Because from the door enters a python. As people see a python entering, listen carefully, huh? As people see a python entering, some of them rush away because of fear. Some of them pick up sticks to hit him. As Ali, delivering khutbah, sees this instance, he puts his hand out. So don't touch him. Don't harm him. As Ali puts his hand up, the people stop. That python comes. Rewaad se, Jabir ibn Abdullah Jofi is narrating. Says Imam comes. The, the, the python comes. Comes to the place, to the member of Ali. He's narrating through a sanat. Not directly. He's 25 years old. Comes to the, to the member. The reward says, the python stands up. Starts talking to Ali. Says salam to Ali. People can't hear him. But when Ali says, wa alaikum salam. People hear him. Then Ali puts his, put, puts his hand down. Sit down. As if to say, wait. Don't talk now. Let me finish my khutbah. The snake puts his head down. The python slides down. Ali completes his khutbah. When he completes his khutbah, he makes an he signs out, makes a sign to, to the python. The python then comes up, comes in front of Ali. Ali is talking to him. He is talking to Ali. After some time, the python gets down, goes away. People worried. Ali talking to a snake appears as if a mukalama is going on. Mukalama means you know what? Two people talking. Kalam, one person talking. Mukalama, conversation taking place, communication taking place. Says Ali, you were talking to the snake. You were talking to the python. What did you understand? You know the language. Ali says, I will tell you what I was talking. This python that came, I did not know him, but I knew who from where he was coming. Saying, tell us who he was. He's saying, he introduced himself to me as Amr ibn Uthman. He says, I'm Amr ibn Uthman from the colony of the Jinnat. And I am the son of Uthman, who is your representative to be taking care of the affairs of the Jinnat. But before passing away, he did a wasiyat to me. Whenever I pass away, you will go to Ali, whose representative I am over the colony of the Jinn. You will go to him and inform him of my death and ask 
him who is going to be the next leader of the jinn so the people ask what did you tell him he says i now you know the jinn as the angels they've got a khususiyat they've got a, a special characteristic they can take shapes they can take forms they can take animal forms they can take human forms they can take insect forms one difference between angels and jinn the angels can take any form jinn can take any form one difference angels cannot take the form of a, a pig a swine they cannot take the form of a dog angels are pagan entities mutahharun they are from the taharat yafta entities they are pure entities they cannot take the form of najis entities like pig like dog but the angels cannot jinn can in this case the jinn took the form of a snake in the language of the snake communicating with ali ali told people ask what did you tell him said i i told the snake your father is dead he was a good man i've got good reports about things i appoint you in the place of your father go as my representative and rule over the colony of the jinn manage their affairs but with one thing ittaqullah maintain the taqwa of god remember the comparison that abdul malik ibn marwan